All right, let's get started. My name is Chuki Chen, and today I'll be talking about Advanced Android Expresso. I have given this presentation before, and sometimes the code is too small to read. So let me know if you cannot see what's on screen, because for the past two times I gave the talk, people tell me afterwards. And I cannot change history. I cannot make the font bigger after the fact. So if you have problems seeing, let me know at the moment. I don't mind interruption. I'd rather you see it rather than, you know, like, oh, I wish I saw what she was presenting. OK, so do let me know if uh, things are too small. <laughs> well, let's get started. What is Expresso? How many of you has done any Android testing? Whoa, awesome. How many of you have done Expresso testing? Almost half of you, great. So a lot of you already know what it is. For those of you who did not raise your hand, Expresso is automatic UI testing, or as I like to call it, no hands testing. Usually when you're running UI tests, you have to be there clicking buttons and typing and then looking and verifying. Expresso help you with that. It simulates user action and then it also verify what is displayed on screen, whether this thing is enabled or not, that kind of thing. So it's a little bit different from JUnit testing in the sense that JUnit testing, you're doing just the logic. You don't actually see the UI. Um, so what's special about Expresso? Because there are actually multiple UI testing libraries out there. What's special about Expresso is that it's built by Google. It's a first party library. So, uh, you get it under the Android testing support library. And it's similar user actions, like I said, the clicks, the types. But the most interesting part is that it has automatic synchronization between the test and the app. What do I mean by automatic synchronization? If you have written UI tests before Expresso, you may have experienced what I experienced, which is that I try to ask Expresso to click on a button. Sometimes it can do it, sometimes it cannot, depending on whether that button is rendered. As a human, we are not fast enough, right? By the time we look at the app and click on it, the button is already there. But automated testing is really fast. So back in the day, what you do is you add some sleep statement. So you sleep for, I don't know, 300 milliseconds, hoping that the button's already rendered before you click on it. With Expresso, the special thing is that Expresso actually watches the UI queue for you, watches the UI thread, and makes sure that there's no UI event queued before it tries to click on buttons or type or anything like that. So that's what I mean by synchronization. It will wait until the app is ready before it go ahead and do things to it. So that's what makes it interesting. Uh, with that, I'm going to go through a Hello World example just to understand the basic structure of Expresso before we dive into more advanced examples. This is the basic formula for Expresso. On view takes a view matcher, for example, with ID. This is telling Expresso, hey, I want to either look at this view or act on this view. So once you have located the view within your app, you can do two things. You can either perform a view action on it, view action being click or swipe or type some text. So once you found the view, you can do something to it. You can also check certain conditions. So that's the view assertion. So maybe you found a text view, you want to assert that, oh, this text view has the text, hello world. Or you may have found a button and you want to assert that that button is enabled. We're going to go through an example with Hello World. This is my app, Hello World. What you do is you cl click on the greet button, and then it gets disabled. For some reason, I only allow people to greet once. So in our example, what we will do in the on view part is that we will locate this button using its ID. In Expresso, that's the with ID function. So I say on view with ID, the ID greet button. So now I found the view. Then I can perform an action, which is click. So Expresso will go ahead and click on that button, and then I can match. So the interesting part here is that I want to verify that the button is not enabled. So rather than having a function called is not enabled, what I have here is I have a function that is enabled and then negating it. So in Expresso, you can combine different view assertion, view matcher, and things like that so that you can have even more powerful functionality. Uh, this whole example and a lot of the different examples are under my GitHub. And I show the link in the beginning and also I will post the link to it on my Twitter account. So if you follow me, then you will also get a link to the whole slide deck afterwards. There will be multiple GitHub repositories throughout the talk. So just 
want to make sure that people don't frantically write URLs while I'm talking because I want you to focus on me. So that's the first example. And then we're going to go through something a little bit more complicated. Before we do that, I want to show you kind of the two different things I'm using here. The highlighted part comes from the Espresso library because they're Android specific, right? I'm looking for an ID. I want to click. I want to see whether it's enabled or not. But the not function comes from Hamcrest. And actually, the Espresso batch, uh, matches built on top of Hamcrest, which is a Java library that allows you to do those kind of matching. And you can mix and match either of them. Here are all the Espresso view matches, view actions, and view assertions that you can do. We are not going to go through all of it today because it will be pretty boring if I just step through one and every one of them. I just want to show this slide because there's a cheat sheet. Uh, you can go ahead and grab that so that when you're writing your own test, you can see what you can do with Espresso. Same goal with Hamcrest. There's also a cheat sheet. Um, what I show you is the not operator. There are also other things like all of, which is get used quite a bit. Um, again, there's a cheat sheet, so you can also refer to that. With that, I'm going to show you how to combine multiple matches to do something slightly more advanced, because this talk is, after all, called Advanced Android Espresso. What we're going to do is go through the example that we are going to try to match the toolbar title. If you have done an Android app, you usually have a title in your app. In my case, it's called My Awesome Title. Now, how do I look for this view so that I can verify the behavior of it? It is not a part of my set content view, so I don't, have not defined an ID for it. How do I find this view? What we can do is use the hierarchy viewer. How many of you have used Hierarchy Viewer before? OK, a fair bit of you. So for those who haven't used it before, it's an Android tool that allows you to look into the structure, essentially, the, the view structure of your app. And what's nice about it is that it shows not just the part that you define with set content view. It shows everything that's displayed on screen. In our case, we can actually find the toolbar. Uh, the resolution is a bit low, but the gray rectangle smack in the middle, that's the toolbar. And we can see that under it, there is a text view. And when you click on it, it will show you that, oh, it's displaying my awesome title. So clearly, this is the text view that we need to find so that we can verify what's displayed. However, we have a slight issue here. This text view doesn't have an ID. So I cannot use the with ID matcher to find it. But because we can see its hierarchy, we can actually use its parent. So instead of saying, oh, I just want to find any text view, which you may have multiple in your app, we will say, I want to find a text view who has a parent who is a toolbar. Let's translate that into Espresso. What we're going to do is, I'll look at the second function. We're going to act on the onView function with all of, which is the Hamcrest matcher. So we have two conditions here. One is, it's assignable from text view, meaning that the view I want to match is a text view itself. But I also want to make sure that it has a parent which is of the class toolbar, well, toolbar class. So with the two conditions combined, we, I can pinpoint this view. And then afterwards, I can call my view assertion, which is the check, and make sure that it contains the proper text that I'm expecting. So this is how you can put multiple matches together to pinpoint something on screen. This is fine, but there is actually a slight problem which is that we are reaching into the inner structure of the toolbar. Today, it's a direct child that is the text field that's displaying the title. Tomorrow, the Android team may decide that, well, I'm going to wrap it inside some other view, like a linear layout, whatever, then your test will break. So I'm going to introduce you how do you do a more robust version using custom matches. In our case, we are going to use the function in toolbar, that is dot get title. That is a part of the public API. So they're not going to just change it because they publish it already. What we're going to do is use this function and match it against the title that we're expecting. Um, so this screen, all that's interesting is that we are going to be, instead of looking for the text view, we're looking for the toolbar, right? So we say on view, it's assignable from the toolbar. And then we're going to check that it matches the with toolbar title, which is a function that we're going to use. And we write ourselves. So this with toolbar title is sort of like the with text that we used earlier, except that we wrote it. And it's a bounded matcher. The syntax is a little bit intimidating, but what it means is that I want to find a toolbar. 
and that is why we have the generics here. And the toolbar, because I'm specifically looking for a toolbar, then in the match safely function, I will get the handle of the toolbar that got matched, and then I can call the function get title on the toolbar. And what I'm doing here is a little bit more interesting. Get title actually returns me a, a child sequence. So I could have just used like equal to to match it. But instead, I'm passing a text matcher, which is again a ham craft matcher, into this function, and then I call test matcher dot matches, and then I get the title. The reason why I do it this way is because there are multiple ham craft matcher that you may want to use. In the previous slide, I showed you that I'm using the if one, so it's just the plain old equal. But you can also use something like contain string if you just want to do a substring match. So it's slightly more powerful, and you don't even need to write those functions. Those are provided to you by Hamcrest. With this, you are using a public API, and it is much less fragile. I think I covered that already. We have the toolbar, and then we will use the text matcher. Again, code sample plus a blog post. So if you want to review what I just said, you can also read the blog post. On data, how many of you have used on data? What does it do? It goes through the adapters and loads all the data that's available and, and tries to match against that right. dynamic data. So like I said, it uses dynamic data. It uses, it, basically, you use it for adapter view. Most of us use that for list view. Maybe you're still using grid view. Um, the reason why you need to do that is when you have a list view, the view that you see is actually a bit more complex. There are multiple views in the background that when you scroll, it gets recycled. So you cannot just pinpoint one particular view. You need to be able to scroll and find the one you need. And this is why you're looking into the data, the adapter, instead of the view. So once again, this is the original Espresso formula. For the on data one, it's slightly different. So the pink one, the view matcher, is replaced by object matcher, which is something that you use to look into your adapter to find the particular object you need. Um, there are, and there's another one that is used here, that's the data options. Data options gives you a little bit more fine grained control. So for example, if you have multiple list views, you want to just match a specific one, then you can say in adapter view, and then you can add with id r.id.talks or something like that. You can also look for a particular child after you found the item itself because you may have a slightly more complex structure for each item. I'm going to go through an example. This list view, pretty simple. It displays a list of numbers. And let's say we want to look for item number 27. Think for a moment. Can you see number 27 on this screen right now? No. As a human, we need to go scroll and find it. So that's why like, on, on data is useful, because Expresso will actually perform the scrolling for you, looking for the item that is 27. Just a little bit of setup. The app itself is done with a list, an array of integers. And I put that into the adapter. And this array of well integers wrapped under this class called item, so that when the list view wants to display, it's know that, oh, I will just display the string value of my integer. And then, one slight twist, when you click on one of the items, it will show in the footer. Can you see the footer? There's uh, number eight in there. So basically, when you click on eight, it will show eight in the footer, just to make it slightly more interesting. Finally, we get to the test part. Um, now, in this test method, what I'm going to do is first, I'll verify that that little footer, which has the ID text, is not displayed in the beginning. And then I will find the item with the value 27 and click on it. After I clicked on it, I want to verify that that footer displays 27 and it also is displayed because it starts out with um, hidden. Part of the reason why I want to show you this is that you can chain these calls, right? So once I located the view with the ID text, I can check that it has 27 and then I can check again that is displayed. So I don't need to go find the view again. So it's kind of a slight shortcut. I don't know why, but it took me months to realize that you can change these things. So I want to like put it out there. So you can even do things like I perform a click and then I check and I perform another click and then check again. You can chain a lot of them as long as um, they are both either view assertions or view actions. 
And the width value part is the part that we actually have to write. Um, once again, it's a bound matcher, but this time, instead of binding to a particular view, it's binding to an item, which is the one I showed you earlier. And again, once Expresso was like looking for a particular item, it will try to call the match safely function, and then depending on what Boolean it returns, it will be like, oh, this is the match, or it will keep going. So in our case, we are just taking the item, converting it into a string, and matches the string that got displayed. So far, so good. Now, we are going to move on to recycler view. This looks very familiar, right? Yeah, question. Um, last slide. Can you explain the uh, parameters of it? Okay, so you would like to get a little bit more deeper on the parameters. Yeah, uh, so there are two functions you need to override when you define your own bounded matcher. The first one is pretty much for debugging. Uh, when your app have a mismatch, it will call the describe to to show you that, oh, I'm looking, I'm expecting the value, and then it says value, which is the one that is passed on to in the, um, in the parameter. So that is, that is essentially used when your test fail. The match safely function will get the item, which is the same as the, when, and if you look at the constructor, the bounded matcher main activity dot item is the same type that will be given to you. Um, so that's how you construct a bounded matcher. Um, it's, it's, I, I believe it's an interface. I'm not sure whether it's an interface or just an abstract class. Um, and then th you can use the same class if you're matching different types of things. You just have to give it a different type. Does that help? OK. So back to recycler view. Recycler view looks remarkably like list view with one difference. You can no longer use on data because Recycle view is a view group. It's not an adapter view. So on data only works with an adapter view, and because recycle one is not recycle view is not one, it would not work. Uh, so you have to do something slightly different. What you need to do instead is if you look at the test that we wrote earlier, the earlier version we have has the bottom one where you have the on data part. We have replaced that in it's, it's the middle call. The on view with ID recycler view. So this time, instead of looking for the, the list, uh, list view in the in adapter view function, we are actually looking for the view itself as on view. And then you're going to perform an action, which is defined in the recycler view actions. And then we have something that's like action on item at position. So telling recycler view, hey, I want you to do something to the item at position 27. And what do you want me to do? Click. I mean, it's, that, that, that's not much to understand here. It's mostly to know that, oh, if you're working with a recycler view, you need to do something different. And the recycler view action is also a part of the Expresso library, but it's, it, I think it's the, in the contrib library. So if you are using just the core, you will not have that. So make sure that you um, check your Gradle dependencies if you couldn't compile the code. Once again, this will be on GitHub, so you can just check. Question. So the question is, if I don't know the exact position, can I use a matcher? You are just one click ahead of me. So besides using uh, action on item at position, there are two more different things that you can use. One is action on holder item, and that is matching a view holder. Or you can use action on item. That takes in a view matcher. So you could use that instead. Thank you. I love it when people set up the stage for me without me even telling them ahead of time. This is great. So another question. So with on data, would it work in the same vein for uh, view data? The question of well, was with, will, with uh, view data, would it work for view pager? That is interesting. I don't remember whether view uh, pager inherits from an adapter view. So on data works on any view that is inheriting from an adapter view. So well, if it is, then it will work. If it is not, then it will not work. So I, I, I don't remember whether it's uh, an adapter view. Good. Let's move on. Again, like I said, there are code examples. You can go and compile and change different things and see how it behaves. 
idling resource. Earlier in the talk, I told you that Espresso has this notion of idling, meaning that it will wait until there are no events queued on your UI thread before it does anything. Um, it also knows to wait for your async task. So if you are running network calls or things like that on async task, it will wait until that throughput is empty before it move on. But what if you are doing other long operations that Expresso doesn't know about? We can go back to sleeping, but that's kind of annoying, right? Because you have to come up with a random number of seconds to sleep. Fortunately, Expresso provides an interface called idling resource, which you can use to define your own idle conditions. We are going to go through an example that is an intent service. So the setup is that I have an app that when I click on a button, it will fire off an intent, launching an intent service and process something, and then call me back with a broadcast receiver intent to display something on our UI. So I want to make sure that that part is done before I verify whatever is displayed is what I'm expecting. So to define a custom idling resource, you need to override three functions. Get name, pretty straightforward. Just need to give it a unique name. If yours clash with another one, then it may get confused because later we need to register the idling resource. So I'm pretty sure Expresso uses the name as the key. So if you give it a duplicate name, it will get confused. So make sure it's unique. And then register idle transition callback allows Expresso to give you a callback so they can stash it away in the member variable so that you can use it in the in is idle now function. That's the meat of the idling resource. What this is, is that Expresso will periodically come and ask you, say, hey, are you idle? And you can either return true or false. If you return true, that means you're idle, then Expresso will move on to whatever next needs to happen. If you say false, then Expresso will, is sleeping actually. It's, it will look back and try to sleep some more and then come back and ask you again. In our example, we define idling as my intent service not running. So when I'm idle and I have a, a resource callback, then I will call the callback to notify Expresso, say, hey, I'm idle, you can go on with life. And then I'll return the idle Boolean. The helper function here is not Expresso specific, but I just want to show you how do you know whether an intent service is running. Uh, I'm going to query the activity manager for the particular class name. In this case, it's called repeat service. So I get the class name and I loop through all the running services and say, hey, do you find the one that I'm looking for? If it, run, it finds it, then it's running, it's tr then it returns true, and then I will negate that to say that it's idle. So running means not idle. Good. Once again, here we uh, need to register. Again, register is pretty straightforward. Usually what you do is that you do it before your test run, you register it, and then after your test finish, you unregister. Here I'm using JUnit4 syntax, so that's why you see the at before and the at after tag. If you're still in JUnit3, then you will do it in setup and teardown. Um, there are some cases where you may want to do it within your test rather than before and after, but most of the time you can just use this. And this, I actually wrote three blog posts on it because for some reason this is a very confusing topic. Um, so you can go ahead and read those and again, you can download the code and compile it. Um, and then we are going to go through Dagger and Mojito. They are not really strictly Expresso, I mean clearly because it's something else, but to be able to run tests that's repeatable, it's always nice to try to eliminate as much external dependency as possible. And Dagger and Mokita will help you with that. Dagger is a dependency injection library. Uh, how many of you have used Dagger before? Oh, okay, so like one third of you. Um, I will go through an example, so don't worry if you have not used it before. But what we're using it for is to be able to provide different objects in your app and in your test. Because in our test, we would like to provide mock objects so that we can control what are the conditions so that we know what we are verifying. Uh, how do we do that? We're going to use Mokito. Mokito is a library that allows you to mock objects in test. Well, not in test, but most people use it in test. You can mock it in your app as well. I have never done that before. Uh, so we are going to use that in our test. Let's go through an example. Uh, we're going to set up Dagger. This is Dagger 2 syntax, slightly different from Dagger 1. What we're going to do is that we're going to have a component. 
In DEGA lingo, component is essentially a collection of modules. Uh, so we have an interface that's a demo component, which we are going to extend in the application called application component, and that is going to contain a module called clock module. In our test, we will do the same thing. We'll extend the demo component, except that it will be using the mock clock module, and it will also inject on the test. I have added a diagram so that it's a little bit easier to understand. Um, so if you go and look at the demo component on top, it has a method that says inject into the main activity. So it means that you will be able to provide your modules to main activity. So application component, because it extends demo component, is able to inject into main activity. If you look at the diagram at the bottom, the test component, not only that it injects into the main activity, it also injects into the main activity test. And that is because if you look at the interface test component, it has an additional method. The other thing to pay attention here is singleton. So when I'm annotating these components, I have singleton and then component. Singleton means that there will be only one instance throughout your app, so that when I am changing the mock clock module in my test, the app will be using the same one rather than getting a new one generated. This way, you know that you can change the app state and then verify what you want to verify. So, here we are, we are in the application. Um, in the onCreate function, we need to create these components. And how data works is that previous slide, what I'm defining are interfaces. And Dega will go ahead and actually generate the code that actually fills in the inject function and all these different things so that you can actually call them. Which is why we have a super long name here, Dega demo application underscore application component. This is an auto-generated name, which is why it's super long. But what it does is that once you have that, you can build using the module that you want. So in this case, we are in the application, so we are going to have the real clock module. And then we are also going to expose uh, the set component function in the application so that when we are in test, we can create a test component and then set it so that our application will be using the test component instead. Wow, all this setup, why are we doing all these things? We do all these things so that we can actually run our test in a predictable manner. In this sample, what we are doing is an app that displays today's date. If you think about it, today's date changes every day. Right, so I'm go how am I going to write a test to verify that the string displayed is the correct date? Well, if you set it up the way that we are setting it up right now with Dagger and Mokito, what you can do is that in the app, which is the clock module, you will use, um, so this is Joda time, which is a uh, Java daytime library. We will call new daytime, which we will actually return you the current date and time. However, if we are in the test, we are going to use Mokito, and this is the syntax of Mokito, so it's telling when someone calls the function get now on the clock, I'm going to return a new daytime, but at this particular moment in time, which is 2008 in September 23rd, which is the day when Android launched. So we can freeze in time, and then now, when we are in our Expresso test, we can do something like this, right? On view with ID date, so I'm looking for a text view that has the date, as the ID, and then I can actually check that it contains the string 2008-09-23. If we are not going to mock the clock, well then every time we run this, it's going to be different. So this is why I want to include a little bit of something that's beyond Expresso to help you write test. Um, there is more info, again, uh, there you can go through the blog post which explain what I just explained, and there is a repository that you can download as well. There's one more thing, this third link is a video course that I recorded which goes through how do you do use Dagger, but not Mokito, to test shared preferences. Because shared preferences persist the state, if you don't mock it, then what will happen is that the first time you run your test, you may be save some data, and the second time you come back, the data is already there. 
So again, it, it makes it not predictable because when you run the test, you don't know whether somebody else ran the test before. So this will go through setting up using Dagger but providing an in-memory shared preferences so that each time you run the test, it's load fresh. You're saving your data inside in memory so that when you, the test tear down, it, it's gone rather than saving to disk, which is what um, shared preferences normally do. Question is, what about SQLite? <coughs> you can do something just like that. In fact, um, I'm going to show you in the repository way at the end that has an example to test SQLite. So, wait for 15 minutes or so. Uh, so, in summary, we have done a lot. We have done view matcher, view action, view assertion, which is the basic espresso formula. And I showed you how to combine different matches. That was the two by examples where we have the child that's with a certain parent that you're looking for. And I also show you how to write a custom measure again with a two by example. And then I show you how to do recycle view and list view. Moving on, we have island resource and then Dagger and Mokito. So this is actually the end of my talk as I gave it previously because the previous version only has, I only had 40 minutes. And since we are in an extended version, I'm going to show you something well, I think pretty cool, but it involves a live demo. So it may or may not work, so bear with me. Um, so I'm gonna switch to Android Studio now. Okay, good. Uh, so we are going to look at this example, which integrates with an external app. Um, it is a barcode scanner. So let me scroll down a little bit here. The idea is that I am going to use the barcode scanner app to scan a barcode and then take the result back into my app. So here, what I'm doing is, first of all, I have this function called is, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, ZX crossing, I guess, library supported. Um, I don't know if anyone used that before, this, this is the barcode scanner. If I jump into this function, what it's doing is that it, it tries to ask the system whether there is an app that's able to handle this intent, which is a string. Um, that is what that app looks for. So if it is supported, meaning that I have that app installed, what I'm going to do is when someone clicks on the scan button, I'm going to go ahead and launch that app and then wait for it to give me back the result, which is the barcode. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to switch to this. Uh, so I'm going to launch the app. Uh, so that's a big scan button. And I have a bar of chocolate that has this barcode in it. So I'm going to click scan. And let's see if that works. Oh, I'm too nervous. I'm shaking too much. All right, let's make sure that I don't shake too much. Come on. That's what you get for live demo. Yay, so that worked. Uh, so that's the app. Now, the interesting part is how are you going to test that, right? So there are two problems here. One is I'm not going to go scan bars of chocolate uh, you know, every time I run my test. Um, the other problem is it depends on the fact that the barcode scanning app is installed. So I will show you have two ways to, to deal with this problem. The first is how do I essentially mock the scanning? If you are familiar with, um, I don't know how many of you have used the Expresso Intense kind of extension? No hands, nobody? Great, that means I'm teaching you something. So what we are going to do in our test is we are going to go ahead and create an intent that is the data that we expect to be returned to us in the start activity for result function. And then we are going to put inside this data the fields that we expect the barcode scanner to return to us and also that we are going to get the <coughs> result okay, meaning that everything is good. Um, so I need to scroll a little bit here. So I'm creating a new activity result with the both the 
result code and the data. Once I have done that, then I can ask Expresso to essentially, it's just kind of like the Mojito one, is that if somebody calls the scan action, go ahead and report, respond with this canned result. Um, so once I have all that set up, then I can go ahead and do what I usually do. I find the button, make sure that it's displayed, I click on it. And then because I have set up the intending here, it will return the result without me actually going to look for a bar of chocolate and scanning it, and then I can verify that. So that's pretty good. We solved half one half of the problem. Um, the problem, the second half of the problem is that I, here in the main function, I have a precondition. I said if I have the barcode scanning app installed, I'm going to show you the scan button. If I don't, I'm going to just complain that it's not there, which I conveniently have done it in my emulator. So if I'm on my emulator, then instead of having the scan button, it's going to say, but I don't have a barcode scanner. So one way to deal with it, which is kind of the lazy way, is I'm going to have an assume statement here. So it says assume that the, uh, the, the, the scanning library pre is present. So what happens is that if I run this on, let me see if I dare to try running it live. Um, if I run it on my, it doesn't look that good, huh? Um, if I run it on my real device, then it will actually exercise the whole thing and go through and make sure that it works. Except I can't see if it's actually running. This problem of presenting is, I can't see the panes here. Let's see, because there's usually a run pane, but this, I can't see it anymore. Okay, it's, it, it's spinning, so. Um, so anyway, so we'll wait for half a minute. If it doesn't work, then we'll just move on. Oh, do you see? What, what, what? Okay, not yet, not yet. Something's happened. It's going to change, like the screen's going to change. Um, and it's going to, instead of a UPC, it's going to be an EAN code. That's, uh, that's the data that I have canned. Welcome to Android development. Yeah. It is not fast. Ah, oh, okay, now it's happening. So it, it's uh, reinstalling and rerunning. And then you can see the expected result in the back. It says EAN13 and the 978, blah, blah, blah. That's the result that I'm feeding it. Um, but usually this is the fun part where you can actually see the app running. Okay, okay, installing, installing. I, I should know better that running live demo is... Uh, not that exciting actually. Come on, you can do it. Okay, running. It, it, it comes up uh, uh, and it comes back down. Yeah, that's all there is to see. Uh, but <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not that exciting. Yay. Um, the Jenny motion part, I'm not quite sure why um, it's not showing up on my list of, I don't see my device. Uh, no, I don't need that. No, why do I, why, why do I click on that? That is not a good idea. Okay, so we're not going to see the Jenny motion part, but I will just tell you what will happen if you try to run it there. Is that because of this assume statement is false, it will say that it skipped the test because the precondition is not true, so it's not going to bother. So in a way, it's good because you know that your code is not broken; it just could not run the test because you could also potentially just try to run it, try like push it onto your continuous build. And it's like, ah, oh, I failed because there is no barcode scanner installed. What I'm going to show you is an alternative way of doing this, which is to use the mocking S. But rather than mocking with dagger, I'm going to show you how to mock with build flavors. This is a technique that I learned from the Android testing library. Is assume, where's the assume method coming from? The assume tree? Is that espresso or is that? It's J unit. The ex okay. assume comes from J unit. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Okay, for some reason it's not seeing my uh, my emulator, so I'm going to reboot that. 
and that, and that. Everybody go home. Um, so bear with me a bit. I'm going to relaunch my emulator and switch the repository. So let me just show you how the repository is set up here. Uh, so the code here is slightly different from what I've shown you earlier. It has this thing called a bridge, which is a wrapper that I use for communicating with the barcode scanner app. And if I can see this, Oh, this is going to be so much fun. I need to see the build variants. Okay, um, so right now I'm in the product, uh, prod debug variant. I also have mock debug, and it's going to provide a different injection using the build variant. So in prod, what's going to happen, if I click through here, is it's going to give me this bridge which essentially forwards things to the real implementation. So this code is exactly the same as the previous version I showed you. This actually goes to the system and query whether there is a barcode scanner installed. Excuse me. And then the scan function will actually call start activity for result. And then it will process it in on the activity result. If we want to test, what we are going to do is we are going to, oh, how did I get back that? Yeah, here, okay. Build variants. We are going to switch to the mock version of it. And the injection here will be different. Uh, we have to wait for Gradle to think because we are switching build flavor. So while Gradle is thinking, I'm going to show you. Uh, how the project files are set up. If you go look at build.gradle, we have two different build flavors. One is, I mean, product flavors. One is mock and one is prod. And that's it. It's not a lot to do in the Gradle file itself. But if you look at the directory structure, you can see that there are two directories here. One is the mock directory, one is the prod directory. And this is how we are able to give two different versions of, well, essentially the same thing depending on whether we want to mock it in test or we want to do the real thing. So in the mock version, the provide uh, zebra crossing bridge function will give you the mockito version, which is an instance because we want to be able to use the same object in both test and in your app. So in the app, if it comes along, it will get this mocked bridge. With that, we are going to be able to mock everything. So now we can actually test both scenario. We can test the scenario with not supported. So here in the test, I go ahead and grab that bridge because we are in the mock flavor, it's the mock bridge. So I can use Mockito to say that if the is supported function is called, I am going to go ahead and return false. Which means that when I launch the activity, I can verify that the scan button is not displayed and I'm not going to display the format, which is like whether it's a barcode or an ISPN. And the result is going to say, oh, you know, it's not supported. I can also verify the other case, which is that it is supported. So in this case, I'm going to say when somebody calls the in is supported function, <coughs> and the reason why we have this mockito.any cards is because the is supported function takes an argument, which is the context. And it doesn't really matter what it is because what, what we are going to do is ignore that and just go ahead and return true so that the button is displayed. And this way we are not actually querying the system so I can run this test whether the barcode scanning app is installed or not. Now let's get to the really interesting part which is that I need to set up Expresso so that, uh, actually Mokito, so that when somebody clicks on my button, this bridge is going to return the result that I need. 
So this is a little bit more complicated, so let's step through it together. When somebody calls the set listener function, I'm going to call this argument capture to capture the listener. So essentially, at this moment in time, um, let me just show you the app so that you know what's happening. So in the app, what I do is that if the scanning is supported, I'm going to go ahead and set listener on the bridge um, so that when somebody scan, I can handle the results that is returned to me from the barcode scanner. So when I call this set listener, in the test, it's going to secretly stash it away in this capture. Then next, when someone calls the scan function, which is what happens when you click the scan button, I'm going to go ahead and grab that value out of the value that was given to me in set listener and make sure that you know the guy's not messing around and give me a no pointer. And then I'm going to go ahead and call the scan result function with the result that I want. And then with that, I am going to be able to launch my activity, click on my scan button, and then verify the result. So this is an alternative way to the expressive intent one. So I, we are actually bypassing the whole intent system and using our own logic so that when someone clicks on it, instead of launch, trying to launch a new activity, you're going to return the result yourself. And let me see if the, oh, I forgot to launch the emulator. Sorry about that. Um, again, the demo is not going to be super exciting because it's going to be just like, oh, this happened and that happened. But I want to show you anyway. Question. Should we combine these two and still have the mock version but still use the intent? So the question is, can you combine these two and have the mock version and still use the intent? Yes, you can do that. So you can, then in that case, you're going to probably just mock the, ver the, the part that verifies whether you have the, what is it called, the, the app installed. But the problem is that if you do that and you pretend that the app is installed and then you go ahead and try to click on that button, what's going to happen is that the button won't be there because the logic of the app will, well actually sorry, the other way, the button will be there but when you click on it, it will not actually try to launch an activity because there's no activity on the system that is able to handle the scan action. So then Expresso, all it does is just catches the intent when someone says, hey, I'm going to go ahead and launch the barcode scanner. But if you never call that, it will never catch that. So the intent um, catching part is not going to work. So the rest of your test is not going to work. So theoretically, I mean, you, you could, but your test is not going to work. So I guess practically the answer is no, don't do that. All right, so let's run this. So right click, run, agenda motion. Okay, um, so I like this better in this particular scenario because I can test both cases. I can test both the case when I have the backup standard already installed and also the case when it's not installed. Um, so any question on this? Well, yes. Right, so the question is, can you return a, an image instead of a string, say you're mocking the camera? Yes, you can do that. So depending on how your app actually integrates with the camera, uh, so there are two ways you integrate with the camera. So some, you can extract a bitmap directly out of the intent, right? So then you can directly mock, just like what I did in the earlier example, create a bitmap somehow, uh, and then s set that into your intent and return that as data. There's a second way of doing that, which is you actually provide a path for the camera so that it takes the picture and then write it to path. And the reason why you may do that is because the resolution is higher. Like the intent version only returns you a tiny thumbnail. So if you're doing that, then it's a little bit more involved. So like you will need to, okay, no, I, don't know, I don't want to miss the action. So it's like almost running. Um, so if you are running, if you are going to be using that instead, then you will need to also kind of what does the rest of your app do, right? The rest of your app is probably going to go look at that location and then fetch the image. Then you need to mock that part out as well. So yeah, you can definitely do that using the same intent. Oh, oh, it's running, it's running. All right. So you see both cases? <laughs> it's really fast. Um, so it did the scan version, which it loaded up a click and then it pretended that it actually interacted with the uh, zebra crossing library and then displayed the result. Or it also run the other version when the actual library is missing. 
Good, no questions? All right, so we are going to return to the previous question that got asked, which is testing SQLite, right? Beyond all those things that I already showed you, I also have open source and complete app that I wrote, which uses the Google Plus API and the nearby API and also a database. What this app does is that you can click on the sign in button, it will log you in via Google Plus, and then it's going to use the nearby API so that you can take your phone and your friend's phone, and then it's going to transmit the Google Plus API, which is just the name, uh, over, and then use it to spell some words. Um, so how do you test that? Like how do you, sure, maybe you can have a Google account already set up on your test device, but then how do you have two devices that's going to use Bluetooth to talk to each other? So I use a lot of the technique that I showed you earlier in Mokilo, basically capturing a, a listener and then replaying it right back. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting is the way that I also use what I call a UI-less instrumentation to test the database. So the way this is set up is that in your app, it's going to use one database. But in the test, it's going to have a different constructor so that you can give it a test database, which you can act on it. It will start off empty because it didn't exist yet. And then you can write things to it, read things to it, and verify what it's doing. And then at the end of the test, that test database is going to be just bulldozed over. It's going to be deleted. Uh, so the reason why I call it UI-less instrumentation is that it's not JUnit testing. It still requires a context to be able to interact with SQLite. But it doesn't have any UI. It's not expressive. Nobody's clicking on any buttons. So it's kind of like an in-between thing. Um, so if you are interested in testing your SQLite database, definitely check out that repository. Um, and I also have JUnit testing in that as well because Expresso is only part of what you do. Um, you, you should do as much JUnit as you can just because they run faster. Um, so I use JUnit testing for the model testing, essentially. I have some POJOs, like plain old Java object, that doesn't interact with the Java, uh, Android classes at all. So I set some fields and then I, I call some getters and make sure that the model is consistent. I really think that this is an awesome repository that you all should check out, but if you don't believe me, when I posted this on Google+, someone said that this repository has some seriously badass testing kung fu on display. Uh, so, don't take my word for it, take his word, uh, go check it out and the reason why I open source it is because I feel like there's a lot of toy examples out there that kind of show you this one little thing. Um, th this app itself is much more beefy. There are also actually two other apps that you may want to check out. One is called Topeka, and the other one is just the Google I.O. Uh, schedule app. Both of them actually has Expresso testing in it. and It's really difficult to find open source app that actually comes with tests. Usually you find open source libraries, which comes with tests, but it's kind of not the same like the mentality is very different when you're testing a library versus testing an app. So I will highly recommend you checking out those as well. And I'm going to put that in my um, tweet after, after I'm done with the presentation as well so that you can figure out what that is. So if you would be so kind to follow me on Twitter, you will be rewarded. <laughs> um, with that, thank you very much. The whole slide deck is on the first link, so if you get that link written down, you can then come and click on all these other things, which are the GitHub repository for all the codes that I've gone through so far. And um, I also teach on Prosite, which is a uh, video library for, uh, for various technologies. So that's the fourth link. Um, and I also sell published video classes because why not? And that's where the uh, Share Preferences course is published. And beyond that, I do a lot of public speaking. So if you're interested in that, you can check out the text speak link. That's the newsletter on public speaking. And then the rest is just where you can find me on the internet, blog, Twitter, and uh, Google+. Thank you very much.